John Weigelt, your coordinating editor for CSAP 17, Audio Companion. I've asked Dr. Page, one of our CSAP 17 authors, to speak with me today. John, can you share with our audience where you are located, your primary focus of your clinical practice, and maybe a little bit of how you spend your usual day, if there is one of those? Sure, I'd be happy to. I'm John Page. I'm a professor of clinical surgery at LSU Health New Orleans in the Department of uh, Surgery there. I like to call myself a simple country surgeon. I am a general surgeon. I do uh, hernia. I do uh, minimally invasive surgical procedures as well. Uh, I got my fellowship in minimally invasive surgery, but I like to think I can uh, be a, a typical general surgeon. What's my day like? It depends on the day, as you know, but my typical day, uh, if I'm doing clinics, I'll just give you my typical week if that's all right. So my typical week is Mondays. I have clinic in my private clinic uh, Monday morning, and then Monday afternoon, I usually do cases from that clinic over at a community hospital. Tuesday, I have clinic at the uh, University Medical Center, which is the relatively newly built medical center uh, in New Orleans uh, that was a, which is currently a state private kind of collaboration. And we have our general surgery clinic there all day on Tuesday. Wednesday, I operate in the morning at the University Medical Center doing my cases. And then in the afternoon, I am the director of wound care at UMC. And so I have a a wound care clinic that I go to. Thursday is academic day. Uh, So in the morning is academic and various meetings for research that I do. My main interest in research is team training and uh, human factors analysis and simulation-based education. And the afternoon, depending on what my schedule uh, is like, I will either operate or uh, do academic work. And then Friday all day, I operate at University Medical Center. Sounds like a busy week. Yes, it's a busy week. And uh, and then, of course, as you know, you uh, deal with all the uh, new, new things that arrive and pop up. So it's never a dull moment, right? Uh, that is true. Never a dull mo- moment. So anyway, I I thank you for that sort of synopsis of what uh, your week looks like. And I have asked you to share some of your thoughts about various conditions that a surgeon faces. And most of them come from questions within CSAP 17 that are located in the abdomen category. But some of them come from questions that were written but not necessarily selected for the final draft of CSAP 17. But if my memory serves me right, the committee had a lot of discussion, and I, I'm hoping that you can help clarify some of the issues in those topics. So anyway, l- let's get started. I know you that you do a fair amount of endoscopy. So my first question is, what's your sedation protocol today for an upper GI scope? We usually do most of our endoscopy over at the University Medical Center, and we uh, work in the endoscopy suite with the GI doctors. And typically what we do is we actually have anesthesia help us with our sedation. So you, we in, in the state of Louisiana, uh, nurse anesthetists are supervised by uh, anesthesiologists so they can go ahead and perform uh, sedation under, you know, under supervision from an anesthesiologist who doesn't necessarily have to be in the room. And so typically we partner with them to have them uh, perform sedation while we're doing our uh, endoscopy. Why do we do that? One reason is our patients at UMC are not necessarily um, ASA 1 or 2. <laughs> they can be uh, rather sick or um, have uh, difficult airways with, um, you know, malum potty 4 where you can't really see the uvula, especially um, one of my partners does a lot of the uh, bariatric, and so you can't see that. So we feel that it is uh, safer, and just given the profile of our patients, we uh, have anesthesia help us out. There is a thought, and there is, I know in the literature, uh, there's one argument is it's quicker, but that really hasn't been proven necessarily by uh, reviews. And I do know that if you have nurse-administered anesthesia, 
that uh, the evidence does seem to indicate that you, you can get a faster recovery. But again, this is uh, not an outpatient facility. It's more of a, a hospital with um, kind of a different patient mix. We actually do a very similar approach uh, in our endoscopy suite. And I would ask you a question that I always ask my anesthesia colleagues is, what do you think is the percent of people that get intubated rather than just having conscious sedation when you've got a group of anesthesiologists uh, doing your sedation? Do you have any feel for that? It's not super high. I, my, my feel is that we don't end up intubating a lot of people. If they are uh, really high risk and uh, there's a concern, but, but my feel is we don't, we don't do that often, especially in the endoscopy suite. Now, sometimes you might want to bring them to the OR, and then you would intubate there and if you feel that you want to do a more extensive or that sort of thing. But my feel is not that often. All right, well, let me ask another question related to sedation, and that's topical anesthesia. Uh, do you use that or, or not? Well, so since we do nurse sedation, I usually don't use it in the endoscopy suite. In the OR, it's kind of a moot point, so we usually don't. So that's kind of our practice. If people use it, are there any cautions or complications they need to know about? Well, so one thing to keep in mind is um, it's like everything, nothing's free. What I mean is, you know, you can't just give it, give it, give it. You got to be aware of toxicity. That's one. The other thing is with the uh, benzocaine, you have that risk of having the hemoglobinemia. It's very rare. You know, it's what, one in 7,000 exposures? But endoscopy is common, right? So <laughs> even though it's one in 7,000, there's a lot done. And so you can get the met hemoglobinemia, and that can be uh, difficult unless you have a high index of suspicion to identify, and it can lead to um, some pretty significant trouble if you don't. Have you seen a case? I personally have not. I've had cases where in, in breast when you use um, methylene blue, but it's not really met hemoglobinemia. It's, this, it's just the... Uh, it appears that they're hypoxic and they're not really. And the reason why I mention that is methylene blue is used as a treatment for it. And that's the first line treatment because of how it works. I mean, the, 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 you get the met hemoglobinemia because you have the uh, reduction of ferrous to ferric iron. So you get, you, know, you always wonder like, why did I take all that chemistry and all that? And I, I try to let our students know, and I, I will, maybe we'll come back to this again, that I try to point out to them, you know, here, this is chemistry in action, or this is uh, physics in action, and that's why you took it. But this is chemistry in action, right? So you go from a 2 plus to 3 plus. And what happens is that it shifts that, the oxygen curve to the left. And then you get a functional anemia, but you also have uh, issues with hypoxemia. And it can be deceiving because it's bound, right? So the pulse ox doesn't necessarily go down to very, very low levels. It's like 85 to 90% range. And they, people are becoming cyanotic in front of you. So it's, you, you really have to have a, a high index of suspicion and get, get that ABG if you're suspicious for it for met hemoglobinemia and then give that, uh, that uh, one to two milligrams of methylene blue as a treatment because the methylene blue the way it works, it helps to uh, reduce the amount of met hemoglobin. So I, I think most of us have stopped using benzocaine just because of that, and there's some other topicals that are used, but it, it, it is something that is, it's one of those things like, like usual, uh, it's not very common, so it, it makes a great test question no matter what right. you say. <laughs> That's right. So let's go back to something practical maybe. So I know you teach residents, and... Obviously, endoscopy is a big part of surgical training now, and I have, I guess, the most difficult part of trying to teach a new endoscopist about an upper GI is how to enter the esophagus, uh, especially if you've got a patient who is awake and just has conscious sedation. Do you, 
Do you have any pointers or any tricks when you're teaching that neophyte endoscopist uh, for the first time as they, they try to pass the scope? One thing I like to try to do and let people know is is when I am putting the scope in, what I like to do is to curve it, curve it kind of in the in the manner that the uh, oropharynx is and going into the esophagus. So instead of putting it straight and then trying to curve down, I have it curved. So as you put it in, it's just kind of following the base of the tongue, hopefully, so that you can go down there and then giving little amounts, little puffs of air to be able to see the um, the esophagus. The other thing is you want to be able to be able to identify the cords and to realize that, you know, the trach is anterior to the esophagus. So if you are seeing the cords, you want to try to go a little more posterior to be able to intubate that esophagus and get in um, more easily. Uh, those are some of the things with the awake patient. Obviously, in the um, when I'm in the OR doing foregut surgery, minimally invasive foregut surgery, we obviously are checking things and, and putting in um, putting in the endoscope. And, and the key there, and what I try to teach them, is to really put the hand down there. You're not going to have a gag reflex, and really try to get to the base of the tongue and lift that jaw up when you're doing it. You know, curve the curve the uh, endoscope, lift that jaw up so that you can go down and get in. I find that's been very useful. The other thing is you can kind of have them, uh, you know, do their little sniffing position where you br- bring the chin down uh, to try to help um, align things up for you. Let's talk about a complication of endoscopy, which uh, I am sure we've all seen one or two, but seems to be in a state of flux or, let's say, change of management. So esophageal perforations, iatrogenic perforations, they're usually small. If they're recognized early, uh, then the call goes out for help. But lately, I've been seeing many of these closed with clips, and then I'm just asked to follow the patient. Is that happening at your institution? Yes, so it's it's it, thankfully the uh, endoscopic approach has developed because, um, as you say, they ask you to follow. Um, typically, what I do is I want to make sure that it's working well, so I usually get a swallow just to make sure that it's properly closed. And then, typically, what I do is I'll give them uh, some antibiotics and watch them and follow the white count and and make sure that they're improving. But the, the the beauty is, you know, in the old days, what did you have to do? I mean, you were doing thoracotomies and going in and over sewing these small leaks and putting in chest tubes and all that sort of thing. I usually don't put in a chest tube unless they start developing a uh, an effusion. So you're you're pretty pleased with uh, the closure of these small perforations with these endoscopically placed clips? Yes, you know, as long as we're not seeing massive, you know, I, I usually test it. So, but yes, yes, I think it's it's a way to. Um, I, I've seen talks where <laughs> I can tell you this when I saw a talk where the uh, experts in this technique they show this one talk where. They're working with a partner, and the partner was trying to do endoscopy, and they're all, do you think I'm in? And they look, and they show this video of of the lung. <laughs> and um, this particular individual is an expert endoscopist, and he was able to clip it closed, and the patient did all right, but the point – did well. And But the point is you have that uh, ability now where before – Especially sometimes when these patients are elderly patients, and if you if you, if you have to be more um, invasive, the outcome's not quite as good. Well, let's talk about another device. I guess uh, the endoscope is a device, but this is a little different, and that's uh, electrosurgical devices that we use in surgery. And and I guess the the first thing is this again is one of the changes in surgical training. So this is part of a routine course now that our residents have to complete. Uh, if I remember, it's a SAGES course. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, it's called FUSE. And it's Fundamental Understanding of Surgical Energy. And I actually, I think it, this was developed maybe uh, five years ago, maybe over a course of five or six years it came out, about six years ago. But I think it's a great idea because and part of the, the needs assessment was that it was just a realization that we use energy all the time. But we really, really aren't 
we weren't at the time quite as aware of exactly how it worked. It was kind of magic, right? But like I said, physics and chemistry will help you in this. Let me give you a few devices and uh, see if you can help explain exactly what, what goes on with them. How about the, the normal bovie? What are we really using there? The important point about a bovie, so electrocautery, is uh, it's, it's a monopolar device. What does that mean? So how does it work? What it is is it's a circuit, and that's, a, that's the important thing to realize when you're using monopolar cautery. The way it works is you create your energy through the electricity, and what happens, the electrical impulse goes into the, uh, the cells, and the electricity creates energy, creates movement, vibration. Vibration creates heat, and the heat then damages a cell. Again, physics and chemistry all at work right there. And so you get that, but the point is the way the, en- the energy moves through is it just doesn't stop there. The way what's happening is the energy is going through a circuit, and that circuit is through your uh, bovi pad. So basically, the bovi pad is super important in that what it's doing is it's allowing an outlet for the energy. So the energy is going through the patient, popping out through the bovi pad, and the concentration is at the point where you are but it's a circuit. So you're grounding out through the, the pad. And it's really important to realize that because that's why they don't want you having the pad near people who've had putting it near a total hip or putting it in an area that doesn't have uh, good padding. Because then what happens is you're not going, it won't necessarily go through the pad. It'll go through an easier way. And that might be through a tissue of the patient. And then you will have an issue with injury. Now, on the monopolar, you've got, a, I, I guess, maybe on m- many of these devices, you've got a cut mode and a coagulation mode. Is there any difference between those? Yes. So the cut mode um, uses more energy. You can get up to 100 degrees Celsius on it. And uh, what that does is it, it's able to penetrate through the tissue better, and it kind of cuts through the tissue. The thing to realize, too, with cut is if you do it, you don't want to be touching the surface. You want to be just above the surface. And by doing that, you can create, you can actually create a degree of coagulation because of the heat and where you are. That's the way cut works. Coagulation is a little different. Coagulation is less energy. It only goes to about, you know, 60 degrees Celsius. And what happens is uh, because it's less energy, it, it remains more kind of towards the surface for tissue damage, but it creates the coagulum or the coagulation instead of just penetration and and kind of slicing through that tissue. One quick point I want to make that uh, is you don't necessarily realize it, and and, uh, Fuse gives this, and I think this is important for learners as well as practicing surgeons. When you are trying to coagulate a cut bleeding vessel, what mode do you think is the best mode to use? Well, I'm sure you're going to tell me. Yes. So if you, so a lot of times, you know, you cut up, you got a bleeding vessel, you pick it up with forceps. Actually, the cut mode is the mode you should use because it's more uniform. And so it's a more uniform distribution of the energy. And so it's going to cause coagulation that vessel better than the coag. We all use the coag mode or before I took the course, I always use a coag mode. I thought, oh, coag, we're going to coag the vessel. But in, in reality, w- with a bleeding vessel that you're picking up and you're trying to you know, stop the bleeding at the end, the cut mode is actually the more effective. Now, I know there's also something we use as an electrocautery, but it's a bipolar device. Now, how does that differ from the monopolar device? Well, so a bipolar creates a circuit between the two instruments. So the, 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 the beauty of the bipolar is instead of having the circuit that, that runs through the patient's body, so the energy going from the tip of the instrument through the body and out through the bovi pad, the pad, the, uh, the grounding device, it goes between the two instruments. So typically you have forceps or if you use something like the ligature, it's going between those two uh, tines and the energy goes between. And so it's very specific where you're, you're putting the energy so the hemostasis can be more meticulous in a sense because you're, you're just going in that area where you want to go. 
And the temperatures, temperatures are more towards um, cut mode than coag mode. It's about 90 degrees. Okay, now the fascinating thing in the question that's in CSAP about these devices was the amount of heat that is generated by the ultrasonic devices, which I, to be very honest, had no idea that it was as high as it is. So what can you tell us about these ultrasonic devices that seem to be ubiquitous now within the operating room? I, I go back to the fuse. I think it was great because, again, like you, I had didn't realize how hot such a device can get and how long it might take for it, the temperature to decrease. For an ultrasonic device, as you know, it's 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 basically uh, me- mechanical energy converted to heat, basically. So right, so you get vibration in the instrument, you get the uh, again physics comes back, you get the vibration and the tissues in between, and then uh, the vibration generates heat, then that coagulates or um, helps divide the tissue. The temperatures, if you can believe it, reach up to 300 degrees Celsius. And the thing that is important to realize is that that's great in the sense that, yes, so when you're going through, you know, you're going to take down, say, the short gastrics on a, uh, a Nissen or, or a parasophageal hernia, that's great because you can go through those vessels and they will coagulate and you can cut through them. The bad part is while you're doing that, you want to be careful not to use your ultrasonic device to grasp things or to touch things right away because it can take 20 seconds for it to go below 100 degrees Celsius. And so if you're touching the, the, the stomach right after, you could have a very pinpoint high energy injury that could result in um, transmural necrosis. Sometimes what I do when I'm using the ultrasound is you're, you're doing that and then you're aware that it's really hot and so if you're touching something, I would touch like the omentum or something that I know is not going to cause a, a, a delayed perforation. Anything else we should know about these electrosurgical devices that we haven't covered? Well, I guess there's a laser, <laughs> the YAG laser. I remember when it was supposed to be our answer to everything. <laughs> right, right. I'm not sure I've seen it used since. <laughs> right. Yeah, so the laser, as you said, everybody thought it was, um, you know, it, it was the um, silver bullet in coagulation, right? But the, the issue with the laser is it's really interesting. It's, so it's only on the surface, and it's actually cold. It only gets to 50 degrees Celsius. So it, it, it's relatively cold related to all the others, and it, what it does is it does well with surface coagulation. Yeah, it it was through the endoscope, I remember, when everybody wanted to be credentialed in using the laser, and after you got credentialed, you suddenly discovered there really wasn't much use for it. (laughs) So The evolution of medicine, correct, or surgery, let's put it that way. Okay, well, let's change topics, and I I really do want to get your input and pick your brain about bariatric surgery, uh, the changes, and some of the problems that we may be facing. So, obviously, we've had a number of different procedures since bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery started, and... uh, it seems to be that we've moved from the RUI bypass to sleeve gastrectomy as the most common procedure done. Is that real? And are there specific reasons for why that is occurring? Yes. That's actually a very significant trend. For the longest time, gastric bypass was the operation that was most commonly performed. And uh, it's been recently that now lap gastric sleeves are the most commonly performed bariatric procedure. The other interesting thing is just in terms of evolution, it's interesting to me because um, I was practicing with the development of this. You know, a lot of times you don't see the evolution uh, necessarily uh, in real time. But this was very interesting because the the development as the, the sleeve as its own procedure was, uh, again, in a uh, sort of serendipity in the sense that uh, Michel Gagné w- was doing, um, when I first started practice, he was doing a lot with the um, biliopancreatic diversion. And the biliopancreatic, laparoscopic, the biliopancreatic diversion, one of the steps is to create a gastric sleeve. 
you create a gastric sleeve, then you divide the duodenum, and then you kind of rearrange the um, small intestines to create a, a very, very short common limb. But the kind of first part of that is the sleeve. And what he was finding was in the very, very obese patients, the uh, complication rates were high. And so he was trying to think of a way to kind of uh, reduce that and came up with this, the idea of, okay, well, why don't I just do a stage procedure and just do the sleeve first and then wait till they lose a little weight because it's, it was a restrictive, it's a restrictive procedure. You're, you're, you're making the stomach smaller, so you're going to lose some weight. And then once they've lost the weight, as you know, in bariatric uh, surgery, one of the, the, the biggest risk factors is how big you are. The higher the BMI, the higher the risk for mortality. And so he, he did that. He did these gastric sleeves. And what he found was people lost weight. And some people didn't want to go on to the rest of the surgery. And they, they kept on losing weight. And so it evolved that then people started doing the sleeves. And what's interesting is bariatric, the way I see the history of bariatric is Oftentimes with restrictive surgeries, i.e. the sleeve is a restrictive surgery, initial great, everything's awesome, and then uh, something comes up, weight regain, issue with the, the way the sleeve is, and then people start taking it out or converting, you know, the, um, the vertical band of gastroplasty was like that. The lap band now is taken out more than it's put in, and again, there was, uh, mainly it was revisions and issues with the band itself. But the sleeve has had more staying power, and I think part of that is you're taking out a good deal of the stomach, and that's having an an impact. And and what you try to do is get a lot of you 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 get you stay on the lesser curve when you're doing that, and so you're getting rid of the fundus, that kind of receptive relaxation. So you're not as able to stretch things out. Is it better than a rewide bypass? A conditional response, right? For certain people, I think it works great, but I, I would not do it on everyone. In my opinion, the sleeve is a great procedure if you don't have significant reflux and in people who are not necessarily uh, diabetic, uh, long-term diabetics. I think um, bypass is better for diabetics and for individuals with reflux because one of the, you know, so Achilles heel, there's always Achilles heel. You know, I mean, the mortality rate is lower with the sleeve than the bypass because you're not making anastomoses. You're, you're just removing the stomach. The, the Achilles heel of the sleeve is um, leaks. And the issue with that is when you get a leak along the, the, the staple line, typically that's up by the angle of hiss. Um, is where they often occur. And when they happen is, the theory is you create this small tube. And so you've changed the um, dynamics, the um, pressure dynamics within the stomach. And so you've, you've created a situation where within that little small tube, the pressure is higher. It's not low pressure as in, say, a normal stomach. And that prevents healing or closure of the leak. So in other words, as an example, uh, you get a leak at the GJ anastomosis in a gastric bypass. Treatment is drain it, you know, uh, nothing by mouth, uh, maybe some TPN. But if you adequately drain it, typically that will close. It will stop unless it's a gigantic leak, but a small leak will, will close and you can treat it that way. With a sleeve, you put, you drain it, it's, it doesn't close because of uh, the pressure dynamics. So it's, 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 it's much more of a headache. You can get people, it's, it acts more like a, a malignant, you know, uh, sinus tract than, than say a, um, something that will go away. And so then you have to, you know, people have tried stents, long-term uh, MPO, TPN, things like that, over sewing. So it can become a big headache. And that, that is the biggest weakness. Fortunately, it's probably what, 2%? So, in essence, uh, the, the, the complication rate related to leaks is acceptable, but if it happens to a patient, it can be a challenge, a challenge for the surgeon in trying to um, fix it. So, my reading of this is that it's usually considered a technical problem, and various authors have various ways to avoid it. Do you have any tricks you want to share with us? Yeah, so as I said, a lot of times it's up by the angle of hiss. So options, what are your options? One, you can use 
buttressing when you're doing your staple firing. So you can get uh, the bovine uh, strips or uh, absorbable uh, PTFE type of strips. And when you're doing your firing is to fire it with that, and that is thought to help prevent the leak. Uh, you can oversew the staple line along that area or along, if you, if you so desire, you can do the whole thing. But typically up by that angle of hiss and up by in, in that area, oversew that to help prevent the leaks. Those are kind of the two main techniques I know to do that. The other thing is you want you, you want to make sure you have a, the proper staple size. You don't want to be using like a white load. You want to make sure you're using the correct load. I think now they have black and gray. And they, they keep changing the colors, yes. But the whole point is the stomach can be very thick, especially down by the antrum. So you want to use um, kind of longer um, staples when you're doing that. And the other technique is when you close, you close your stapler, you want to give time for coaptation. What do I mean by that? You don't want to close and fire right away. You want to close and wait. You know, how they say before you say something, count to three. Same kind of thing. You want you don't want to fire right away. You want to wait because that allows coaptation and that allows kind of the tissues to... Um, come together, be squeezed together, kind of get edema and that sort of stuff out of the way, and it helps for a better hold. Now, when you're doing this, do you have a bougie in place at, at the GE junction or not? Yes. So you can use, you want to use some sort of bougie or you want to use some sort of, uh, some people uh, have used endoscopes, put the endoscope down, but you want to use something along the GE junction and along the lesser curve to help you with sizing it. Typically, you start the sleeve about six centimeters from the pylorus, so you, you, you would start your sleeve there, and then you'd have the bougie in. So bougies, what size? I think that's a debate. The, I guess the bottom line is the smaller size bougie you use, the more uh, the risk for a complication like a leak. Uh, because of pressure and that sort of thing, and the larger one you use, the more the 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 higher the risk for stretching or weight regain. So it's I guess it'd be part of the art. Everybody chooses their different sizes. The thing to do is though you want to make sure that there's something there, and as you follow it, the one area where you can get issues with stricture or tightness is is at the incisura. So you want to make sure that you're not causing a kind of a kink at that level. And then you want to be able to make sure up by the um, GE junction that you're not getting the esophagus. So let me ask you, uh, as this surgery has evolved, is this a surgery that the robot is going to be doing pretty soon? Or the robot is going to be used to do it pretty soon? Um, (laughs) Good question. So uh, I think... It will depend on the surgeon, I guess, is the way I'd say that. I think, you know, the benefit for uh, doing a GJ anastomosis, I can see that if people want to use the robot because you get really good vision and uh, find it kind of fine techniques. In terms of doing a uh, stapled, like, sleeve, uh, I'm not as convinced that it's necessarily going to give you a lot of advantage. I say it's up to the surgeon because there's a, there's a group up in Baton Rouge that they do everything robotic now. And it's like, I guess if you can dock fast and do all that, you know, it's one of these things you want to justify the use of the, the cost, right, of buying a robot, I guess. It's very interesting. The robot was not a common topic for CSAP-17 because most of the committees decided that it was still uh, up to the surgeon, just like you said, to make that decision and and trying to find a, an adequate topic for a question was uh, difficult, let's put it that way. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, in general surgery, so general surgery, foregut surgery, and things that general surgeons do, I, it's not quite as clear-cut as, say, for prostate. Let's go back to the gastric bypass again, and uh, we do have a question about the most common complication, and I believe the answer still is internal hernias. Is so where do they occur, and have we done anything to help avoid them in the post-op period? So, yes. Yeah, so uh, internal hernias are probably a complication that you want to, I, I won't say in the 
peri-op period, but lo- kind of longer-term post-op, that's a complication you want to have on the radar. If you're a general surgeon, you're covering for a group or a bypass person comes in who's had a laparoscopic gastric bypass, you really want, and they come in with abdominal pain, you really want to keep that in the forefront, that he, they could have a hernia, because there are basically three types of hernia you, so you can get. One is, as you do the JJ, you'll do the JJ, and you'll have the, whenever you do that, you're going to divide the um, divide the bowel, staple it back together, and you're going to have the mesenteric leaves. So you want to close those, because you can get a hernia through that, just like you would in a open small bowel if you don't close that those leaves. So that's one. The other one is, it, it's kind of important to know, is that you want to know how the uh, limb was put in because some people uh, will do a retrocolic approach. And so they'll put it through the uh, mesocolon colon and posterior to the transverse colon and into that lesser, the uh, lesser sac and then bring it up that way for the anastomosis. And um, with that, you can get herniation through that mesocolonic tunnel, basically. And especially the, the thing about getting these hernias is a lot of times what happens is when you do the operation, you'll, you know, you put it in, it looks like it's nice and firm. You might uh, secure it with uh, stitches, but they'll lose weight. And as they lose weight, that fat will kind of go away and then you'll get gaps. And that's one thing you got to keep in mind. And the other one that is kind of unique to gastric bypass that you really have to be aware of is the Peterson hernia. And what's a Peterson hernia? A Peterson hernia is, so you're going to bring your, you bring your limb up if it's an anticholic or a retrocholic, there's that divided mesentery. And so what you have is you can have bowel slip behind the mesenteric leaf that is the root limb and cause an obstruction. And those can be very difficult to identify. It'll slip by, so it's in between the mesenteric leaf of the root limb and the mesocolon. It's in that little space. So it's kind of a, a hernia that, that the bowel slip, it's parallel to the, the transverse colon or the mesocolon, slips behind. And the issue with that is hard to identify, can be devastating because you can get a lot of bowel in there that gets strangulated and die. And the way, how do you prevent these? Okay, well, one is you want to stitch your, if you do your retrocolic, you want to try to stitch the, um, put at least some stay stitches there in the, uh, in the uh, mesial colon. You want to close your mesenteric leaves for the small bowel. And for the Peterson, you can close that space by stitching the small bowel mesentery of the root limb to the uh, mesial colon. And you can go up to the level of the transverse colon. Now, if you're doing anticholic, there is a risk that it could slip up above that, but typically uh, people just go up to do that, do that closure at the level between the, uh, the two mesenteries. So identification is really important. Someone comes in with abdominal pain, severe abdominal pain, they've had a laparoscopic gastric bypass, and you've been called in, and uh, everything looks kind of normal, you should have a very low threshold to do diagnostic laparoscopy because they could have a Peterson hernia or some sort of internal herniation that's causing that problem that you cannot see readily on typical uh, plain films. And even on the CT, it can be difficult. One of the classic signs that you should look out for is co- it's called the swirl sign. And what happens is the, there's a portion of small bowel mesentery that has a sw- uh, kind of a swirl look like in those cookies with the swirls on them that you can see. And um, if that something like that is, you should definitely explore. The bottom line is do not necessarily think that the abdominal pain is nothing. Keep, keep in mind that the, the internal hernia is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a complication that you, you kind of have to have a very low threshold in terms of looking for it. Well, you beat me to my question about what do you do about it. So let's let's talk about another problem that is identified in post-op bariatric patients. And is it still true that if they're tachycardic, you you really have to worry? Again, qualified, yes. If they have one tachycardia and then they go back to to regular heart rates, no. But if it's a sustained tachycardia, yes, that is the earliest sign. Tachypnea and tachycardia are the earliest signs of leak in a bariatric patient. 
And again, in those cases, you, you have a low threshold, as you mentioned, to take a look through the laparoscope? Yeah, either take a look through the laparoscope, get a swallow study, you know, work it up. Don't think that, oh, uh, you know, he's tachycardic, uh, it's something else. Uh, yeah. Leak should be first on the differential. Let me ask you another practical question that uh, the residents seem to get caught in all the time, and that is, uh, and actually those of us who see patients uh, for that acute abdominal pain, so they've got a history of a gastric bypass, they come in with abdominal pain, should you pass an NG tube in them, and should it be done blindly, or is this something that needs fluoroscopic control? Definitely, if it's a fresh, do not pass one. You know, a couple weeks or so, I would not pass one blindly. I would definitely consider that with fluoroscopic control. I, I, I would do it under guidance. And, and the other thing with, with this is, if you think about it, they, it's not the same as a, they don't have this gigantic reservoir like a, someone with an with a intact stomach. So it doesn't necessarily uh, help with uh, decompression. All right. Glad to know that's what we should be doing from the experts, though. There's a new question that surfaced in CSAP 17 that I don't remember seeing again. I know about dumping after a VNA, but uh, this is a question that dumping can happen after a gastric bypass. It, it, is this possible? Uh, is it common? Uh, how do I recognize it? Yes, it is possible. Yes, it can be common if the patient uh, does not follow a proper diet. As you know, for dumping syndrome, there are usually two, two phases, right? There's the initial dumping, and then there's the delayed uh, reaction to the dumping. When I talk to patients about bypass, I talk about you know complications. I talk about dumping syndrome, but actually dumping syndrome is one of the ways that helps patients uh, with the bypass in the sense that What's happening is you're eating highly concentrated processed sugars. You eat highly concentrated processed sugars, you eat too much of that. So if, especially with a, in a gastric bypass, it goes straight into the bowel. Your bowel reacts to that. How does it react? And you just, this is the dumping syndrome. The initial one is that your bowel says, wow, this is concentrated sugars. It's too much. And so let's pour fluid in to dilute it. So it suddenly tries to dilute out all these high, highly concentrated processed sugars by pouring a bunch of fluid into the, the bowel. What happens then is you get crampy abdominal pain, diarrhea, and you feel terrible. How does that help with weight loss? Well, it, it's a negative input for people who might try to eat you know, the, the Hershey bar or take the, the sugars and stuff that might lead to uh, weight gain. It is, quote, a complication as well because people can have that. Um, the delayed aspect of it is the insulin is, is released by the pancreas. It says, wow, we got all this sugar going on. Release all this insulin, and then you get this delayed kind of hypoglycemia, tachycardia, nervousness, uh, anxiousness, sweating, because the large amount of insulin suddenly um, is too much, and then you get um, hypoglycemia. But typically for, for gastric bypass patients, it's usually the, the, the latter of the two, so you get that huge amount of uh, concentrated bolus of food in there, and then, and then you get the diarrhea, crampy abdominal pain, and you feel terrible. So how do you prevent it? Eat right. <laughs> so this is, this is why we counsel our bariatric patients postoperatively on, on how to restart the, a diet that is reasonable for them. Is, is, that, is that one of the reasons, at least? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. The, the whole point is they just need to be aware that, you know, they don't have the stomach reservoir because, I mean, what does the stomach do? The stomach dilutes all this stuff. They're not going to have that. So if they drink a milkshake, they're going to have a reaction. Uh, some people get tolerant of it, but, but they have to be aware of that. And so they need to avoid those kind of really concentrated uh, processed carbohydrates. Let's talk about the obese adolescent patient. We, we had a few questions that didn't make it to the core CSAP. And are they appropriate for a bariatric procedure now? And is their workup different than if we're dealing with an adult? I think they, they, in certain circumstances, yes, they're appropriate. Um, workup is a little different than the adult. 
I mean, the issue today is now you're getting you're getting adolescents with uh, adult diseases. They're getting type two diabetes. They're getting sleep apnea. They're getting these terrible comorbidities at such a young age. And in the in the real issue is that it's pretty apparent through uh, epidemiologic studies that if someone's obese as an adolescent, the chances of them staying obese or being, you know, if you're more morbidly obese as an adolescent, you're going to be morbidly obese as an adult. It's like 85%. It's not like you're going to lose that weight on your own. So if you can help these individuals be able to control their input and their weight a little better through this tool, all these bariatric procedures are tools. I always tell patients you can out-eat anything. It's not a silver bullet. It's a tool, but you can give them this tool to help them lose weight. The one, one key thing about when you, if you're looking at adolescents is you want to make sure they're mature in many ways. There's several meanings of that word. One, psychologically, you want to be able, you want to really make sure that they understand uh, what's going on and they have a, uh, they're mature in that sense that they can be able to take this because adolescence has a lot of changes, a lot of these things, and you want to make sure that they're going to be able to handle the change that comes with not being able to eat everything. In addition, you want to make sure the family environment's good. You want to make sure the parents are supportive and that it's not a family environment that's going to sabotage what's going on. And the other aspect of when I say mature is you want to make sure they've reached their bone maturity. That's important. So they've reached their growth. And so a lot of times they'll, they'll, they'll make sure with imaging that bone maturity has been reached before you go ahead and proceed. Is it fair to say that in the obese adolescent patient, the indications for the operation is not solely based on the BMI, but on the associated medical complications that might be present? You do need to take into consideration comorbidities uh, when doing this, and I would not necessarily do it just based solely on BMI. Once again, we'll revisit that probably in the next CSAP, I'm sure. Let's move on to another topic in the same population, though, and that is VTE, or venous thromboembolic disease and obesity, especially perioperative VTE prophylaxis in this patient. Some of the CSAP committees had a lot of discussion about this, and the discussion revolved around drug, what drug to use, and how is dosing done. How do you do it? The best drug would be a low molecular weight heparin. I would give a periop dose of uh, most likely 40 milligrams. I mean, if you do it milligrams per kilogram, you can get some pretty hefty doses, but I think at least 40. And then uh, I would do BID dosing postoperatively. I would refer people, I mean, the issue is, yeah, what do you do? I think, you know, the chest guidelines are excellent. Basically, they're great in terms of risk, assessing risk. And then not only do you assess risk for VTE, and you can use the Caprini scoring system to assess risk, which is the one that CHESS seems to uh, really uh, focus on. They focus on some other ones, but I think the Caprini is a really a, a good one that's often used in lots of places. But they also look at risk of bleeding, and I think that's that, that, that really helps. So you, you think about risk of it happening and risk of bleeding. So if you're a very, very high-risk bleed, you might not necessarily ha- give the low nox, even if you're high risk, until you're sure that the bleeding is going to be uh, acceptable. But in terms of bariatrics, you really want to be aggressive because bariatric patients, the higher the BMI, the higher the risk. The higher the age, the higher the risk. And so uh, you really want to be uh, fairly aggressive with your thromboguards, the whole uh, aspect, ambulation thromboguards, and, and I would use a low molecular weight heparin. But despite the prophylaxis, the, these events still seem to occur, and uh, I know we went through a period where filters were put in. Is, is that gone by the wayside now in the bariatric population or not? 
I think it's gone by the wayside everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look at the most recent chest guidelines, they don't recommend filters, period. Yep. And so I think filters have, you know, again, we talk about evolution. It was very popular. And then, then, then they find out if you leave it in for a long time, you can get complications, erosion, you can get uh, complete thrombosis of the of the vessel. And so I think uh, people have really moved away. I mean, in trauma, they, 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 there's really, what in, I don't even think there's any indication now, as I, rec- as I recall. It's, uh, it's pretty slim. It's pretty slim, so... Okay, well, I want to ask you about some of your academic pursuits, and you kind of mentioned them in the introduction. And uh, tell us what this team training is all about and this human factor analysis. So I am very interested in team dynamics and how team dynamics can impact quality and safety in the delivery of surgical care. Um, There is uh, really good evidence in many industries that highly uh, reliable and effective teams improve outcomes and processes within those industries. You can look at uh, the military, you can look at nuclear energy, you can look at deep sea oil drilling and chemical processing, airline industry, all these what we would call high risk, high dynamic industries. And this is where the human factors comes in and this idea of high reliability organizations and industries benefit from having teams that function cohesively and coordinate well. And there are definitely certain characteristics that have been identified of highly reliable functioning teams, including the the idea of mutual support, the, having a team orientation having an awareness of surroundings and what's going on, as well as an awareness of what the overall plan is, anticipating each other's responses, watching out for each other, this idea of cross-monitoring each other and helping out as needed. All these characteristics are very important in smooth functioning. And and the bottom line is, is what you want is you want this, and it's the idea of what we call resiliency. You want resilient teams. You want people who are resilient in dynamically changing environments. So to be able to adapt in an efficient, effective way to changes that could potentially be catastrophic or could cause an issue during an, an event. What does surgery have to do with it? Well, we live in a, we, we don't live, we operate in a very dynamic high-risk environment where, especially you look at trauma, you know, you have people who are severely injured and uh, have injuries that are life-threatening. And so we, you have to be able to coordinate the, the team very quickly to be able to address these issues to save lives. So surgeons as a group, are, are we receptive to this kind of training? Surgeons tend to uh, be resistant to the training. My feeling is, this is my feeling on that subject. When, when they do train, they find a benefit, usually. Uh, they are resistant to actually doing it. There is a uh, feeling of, uh, you know, kumbaya, this touchy feeling. What you need to do, and the argument's always kind of the bottom line, uh, I do think that what this does is it does help with efficiency and effectiveness, and so it reduces headaches during your day because you're not people aren't running out getting this instrument or that instrument because you've created an environment where you're you're everybody's on the same page. They understand what you want. They 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 know where you're going. They're what you're doing, and then uh, by being more efficient, you potentially can do more. I think there's some research that's shown that, you know, you be, you're able to uh, get X number of minutes, which can be a case done. But I think in terms of making it just less disruptive in terms of the flow of the operation, if you can ever do that, it's a benefit. Let's talk about, I know you're into safety as well, so let's talk about wrong site surgery for a bit. Does your institution or your main institution have a have a protocol or a policy directed at trying to avoid these since they still seem to be a problem in most of our hospitals? The answer is yes, but it's all wrapped up in the uh, Joint Commission stuff, right? You're supposed to do a timeout. 
I guess the important thing to realize about the Joint Commission timeout is it's a process. It's not a one-time event, even though in the OR we see it as a one-time event. To prevent wrong site surgery, they they have a process where you're supposed to do, and, and that's the thing about you talk about what is human factors. Human factors, the axiom upon which human, one of the axioms upon which human factors is based is this concept that we're only human. We're going to make mistakes. We're not perfect. We All humans make mistakes. So the idea is, okay, well, everything we have here is made by us humans, right? So any system we make, any equipment, any type of uh, machine we make could potentially fail or have a flaw in it that we might not identify because it's what we call a latent condition. It's something that's there that we have a blind spot for. When we built it, we didn't realize it. It doesn't appear until that critical moment where it becomes evident and at that point you might lose it. And so the idea is, well, how do you, okay, we're going to make mistakes. How do you uh, mitigate that? How do you try to make that at a minimum. And the idea is, and and what makes a highly reliable, we talk about high reliability. What is high reliability? What's a high reliability organization? I think the best expression, if you're going to put it in one expression, it's mindfulness over mindlessness. What does that mean? That you're looking out, you're constantly looking out, you're, you have a preoccupation with failure in the sense that you're trying, you're constantly looking out for ways a system might break down or not work that could lead to a problem. You're not sitting on your laurels, so to speak, and saying, well, we're safe. We don't have to worry about it. You're not complacent. You're constantly vigilant. And the vigilance and the adaptability when things come around and the resilience are what really make the a high reliability organization work well under very stressful conditions. If you look, think about the airline industry, the miles flown And the safety record is incredible. Well, they're a high reliability organization. They take safety first. I mean, how many times have you been sitting on a tarmac where they say, well, this light isn't coming on on the control panel. We're going to wait for them to change the bulb. And you're like, why are you doing this? Why can't we go? Safety's first. They want to make sure that safety is first, that they're doing the right thing. And that makes a big difference. And the the teamwork comes in in that you want to be able to react and respond if something goes wrong or something new happens. You want to make sure that the team is coordinated and works well. So you want to be able to make sure communication is clear. You want to be very direct. You want to assign roles. You want those people to confirm that by repeating back what's going on. One of the things I love to talk about when I'm talking about teamwork and stuff, is everybody knows the uh, Sully story, right? Uh, Double strike with, what, geese, lost both engines and glided onto the the Hudson, safe, no deaths. Amazing, right? He he obviously had a um, co-pilot. They both had a lot of experience in terms of hours flown, but do you know how often they've flown together? Never, never. So what's the point of that? The point is, it was the crew resource management, it was the teamwork skills, their skills that they learned and they used helped with leading to that beneficial outcome. So wrong site surgery, going back to wrong site surgery. So we, we have the process through the, the timeout, and then we verify procedure, we verify site. And the important thing for verifying site is you want to make sure whatever the site mark is within the prepped field. So you can see it because a lot, of, you know, sometimes people will mark the toe or whatever. They'll mark above and it's not there. But you really want to ver- make sure that that site mark is within the prepped field to verify that you're not doing the wrong site. Let me just ask you. So your your team training as it goes now, do residents at LSU and the faculty at LSU, do they go through it on a routine basis? I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> We have wanted to try to incorporate that at UMC, and before UMC was built, I would do it at the interim hospital. I was doing that on a kind of monthly basis, but I had to give up my OR time to do that, and um, I can't (laughs) anymore. (laughs) So unfortunately, uh, it's not done necessarily in situ with the faculty and the residents, we do do um, training at our Sim Center, 
We have done residents with team training. The one thing that we have done and one thing I've really tried to do is we do do all this kind of stuff with the students. And the, the thought is it's kind of like a vaccine, right? The thought is you're introducing these students that third and fourth year to these concepts and to these ideas that, you know, teamwork is a skill. Teamwork is a skill. Being a good leader is a skill. And if you get, you know, yelled at in the OR by a surgeon because you spoke up and you were worried about something, don't take it personally and just realize that, you know, that person is not exercising those skills very well that day or they don't have the the practice in that skill. And I think that's very important to kind of give them young, as I say. And we've done this team training, OR team training, for um, we have a senior anatomy elective in which uh, fourth-year medical students, it's in February, who are interested in surgery, they do it because they get these dissections and they get all that. But we've incorporated this team training where we're, we're, where they're it. We make them it. They become the surgeon. They get uh, an aortic uh, stab wound or iliac stab wound. And they have to stop the bleeding, right? They have to, but they have to lead the, the team. And we have nurse anesthetist students and we have um, senior undergraduate nursing students who are in the perioperative nursing uh, elective. And it's a great I love it because we're not worried. I'm not worried about if they can stop the bleeding properly. What I'm worried about is that they understand team dynamics and how important that is and how important it is for people to, to be all on the same page and know what's going on among all the team members. And we've been doing that for quite some time. John, I know it's a labor of love. Uh, I have the kind of the same experience with the team steps program, which is, you mentioned uh, the military as a high reliable organization. I mean, that's the Department of Defense's team training course that uh, I have tried uh, many times to introduce uh, to uh, faculty uh, and the hospital and not been very successful. So I, I end up dealing with the students and the residents. So uh, it's a start. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's a start. Um, I'd be very interested to see. How, you know, I would love to be able to uh, get some funding for research to follow that for longer term to see if actually is having an impact. But yeah, it's a start in Team Steps. Team Steps is great. It's a great model. Uh, the AHA now is kind of taking that over. I don't know if you knew that the American Hospital Association. Oh, okay. And uh, it's you know same type. You know they've kind of spruced up the uh, the powerpoints and done some things, but it's the same concept. But they're they bought they, obviously they bought into it because they feel that it's, it would be very helpful for hospitals, right? If we yep. can get everybody on board. Well, John, I, I, I see I've occupied uh, all the time you've given me today, and I appreciate uh, you spending some time with me. And I just want to give you uh, the last word. And uh, if you'd like to add anything about the, the CSAP process, either CSAP, the ACS program, or the audio companion, uh, you've got the floor. I appreciate you inviting me to uh, participate in this. It's always a pleasure. Uh, as you said, uh, some of these topics are labors of love, and I, lo I really enjoy uh, discussing them. Uh, I want to thank you for your leadership with the CSAP program. I think it's a, a wonderful program. I think it's a great uh, method for learning and um, the continuing professional development that uh, we all need to do. And I think it's very comprehensive, and um, it's always a pleasure. It's, you know, I have colleagues who do it, and, and universally, we love just doing it because you learn so much. Uh, you interact with uh, great people. And so we hope we are able to, through the process and through creating the questions, be able to um, impart useful and worthwhile, and which I think it is, because I think it's more practical than, than not in terms of the questions to, to, to practicing surgeons so they can uh, improve the uh, care and outcomes of their patients. Good comments, and I appreciate that, and uh, I, I thank you for being a part of that. So uh, you have a nice day today, and uh, hopefully I'll see you uh, hopefully at the Clinical Congress that's coming up shortly.
Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Thank you. That's the end of this session for this category of the CSAP 17 Audio Companion. This category will continue in the next session.